Welcome back to the program. Keep the emails and the tweets coming. It is hashtag PVO News Hour. It's amazing how mad Australians get when you attack some of their cities. I've been accused of only liking Sydney. I like Perth as well, in fairness. We're going to go live now to Melbourne. Josh Frydenberg, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister in the best city in the world, apparently. Thanks very much for being there. Nice to be with you, Peter. Are you shocked that Canberra didn't make the top ten? Look, Tam Canberra has a nice ambiance about it, but it certainly doesn't have the cachet of Melbourne or Sydney or indeed, to say, say, Perth or our other major capital cities. But Brisbane, Brisbane um, didn't even get in the top ten, Josh Frydenberg. What's going on there? Well, they've got something to aim for, don't they? But we're very proud here in Victoria that not only do we have the MCG and the Yarra, which you referred to, but probably the best coffee in Australia and a great multicultural capital here in, uh, in Melbourne. Oh, best coffee in Australia. Give me a break. Coffee varies <laughs> from shop to shop. That's madness. Um, which is the city in Australia that you dislike the most? Well, I'm not going to go down oh, that path. Oh, come on, you can be honest. We're all on Team Australia, as you said, <laughs> uh, Pete. <laughs> all right. Um, Ed Husick, in his usual tardiness, is running late, so we're going to we're going to do this as a, as a one on one. I mean, I just, I just want to get the city thing out of the way, though. Do, do you think that what does it say about Australia? Slightly more seriousness. We've got what? What is it? I mean, Adelaide makes no sense, but we'll include them. We've got Adelaide, uh, Sydney, uh, your city of Melbourne. Uh, mm -hmm. all in the top cities, as well as Perth, I think, crept in there at 8th or ninth in the top 10. Mm -hmm. Four cities in the top 10 in the world. That's actually pretty impressive. Oh, absolutely. And they're livable for a number of reasons, Peter. I think they're livable because of their relative security. I mean, if you go to other uh, capitals, whether it's Miami or you go to Sao Paulo or, or elsewhere in other countries, uh, other major cities, uh, they don't have the level of security that we do here in our major capital cities, so I think that's one factor. Um, we don't have overcrowding to the extent that you see in other parts of the world. Um, we've got wonderful fresh produce and a harmonious multicultural society, and I think that level of um, of multiculturalism is a real positive because it brings people from all different uh, backgrounds uh, together and uh, I think that adds to the vitality of our cities. Now you used to work uh, for Foreign Minister Alexander Downer in a, in a, in a previous lifetime. You must have travelled the world. Bottom ten cities we've got. Have you been to any of these? <laughs> Abidjan, Tri Tripoli, uh, Harare, <laughs> Algiers, Karachi, Laos, Port Moresby. Have you been to Port Moresby? Yeah, been to Port Moresby. Have you been to any of those other ones? Uh, no, I haven't. I've lucked out on all of those. Damascus? Although that's really there no, because of where, what it's going through at the moment. So Port Moresby then, let me ask you about, I mean, why is that so unlivable? It's, it's crime, I'm guessing. Yeah, there's, there's been a, a, a high degree of crime there, but, uh, you know, I, I was there not that long ago, actually. I went with Julie Bishop when we were in opposition, and uh, um, there's some beautiful parts of... Uh, of Papua New Guinea and uh, and obviously the people are very friendly but just like in every city there there are some elements which are a bit undesirable and uh, and I suppose the level of violence in parts of Port Moresby has seen it marked down this year. Yeah you guys want to send uh, asylum seekers to PNG? Well to Manus Island because we're committed to the offshore uh, processing as a real deterrent to the people smugglers and you can't say it's not working uh, Peter uh, we've had great success in, in effectively stopping the boats and that's producing real dividends, not only saving lives that would have otherwise been lost at sea, but also because we're saving the taxpayer uh, billions of dollars. We've actually closed nine detention centres and we've been able to remove 500 children uh, from detention centres since coming to office and with Scott Morrison's announcement today, more will be removed by the end of the year. Alright, I told you I wanted to talk about economics and I do. Uh, let's just start with uh, and I'm not asking you uh, to, to offer a view on, on Arthur Sinodin, as you know as well as I do that I've got a high regard for his capabilities, but six mm. months without an assistant treasurer with such a difficult budget sell, it's ridiculous. Well, you know, that job has been pretty effectively taken up by Matthias Cormann. You can't fault him in getting the uh, future of financial advice changes, the FOFA changes, uh, through the Senate. Um, that was a great achievement. That was something Arthur worked hard on as well. Uh, but Matthias Cormann, he's a capable guy. He's taken on both portfolios. Of course, it's not ideal. I'll give you that. But, you know, hopefully that will be resolved soon and I hope that uh, Arthur comes back to his position as Assistant Treasurer. Is that an inside word, a, a scoop for us here on PVO News Hour? You're the Parliamentary <laughs> Secretary to the PM. Are you filtering Tony Abbott's thoughts there? 
Uh, certainly not. Uh, I don't know what uh, Tony Abbott is thinking, but one thing I can promise your viewers tonight, Peter, is he doesn't confide in me on uh, who he points to what position, that's for sure. Oh, there you go. We've got a scoop here on PBO News, our tension between the Parliamentary Secretary and, and the Prime Minister. All right, let, let, let's, talk, let's talk about the budget. How, sure. how much of it do you think you'll honestly end up getting through? I mean, I know that the finance team are hopeful that they'll be judged ultimately on outcomes rather than some of the difficulties that are clearly on display in the process and, and with the rhetoric uh, on the way through. Uh, is your view that the outcome will be a sort of a John Howard-esque 70 or 80 per cent uh, of, of what you're after? Look, I hope we do get a lot of it through because I believe it's a good budget, uh, and I said that at the time, and I say that now a few months on. There's do you, do you really think so, though? It's so inconsistent. Yeah. That's the problem. There's good elements to it, but I think one of the reasons sure. the opinion polls uh, are giving it such a damning judgment is because of mm. the inconsistence. PPL, on one hand, uh, cuts in other areas, no changes to superannuation. It, it, there's inconsistencies littered throughout, albeit, as you say, good ideas and follow through uh, to go with that. Well, I don't think the PPL's got anything to do with, for example, our changes to the university, uh, dereg university deregulation or to Medicare co-payments or to change the pension age to 70 uh, or the indexation of fuel excise. I mean, they're all important um, measures that we're taking in various different portfolios. Of course, the media and the opposition have taken upon themselves to focus on a couple of of um, you know more unpopular elements, but I do feel that it's a good budget. There's $300 billion worth of Labor's debt that will be paid back if we're able to pass the measures. We're going to get more people into the workforce, particularly seniors and young people, with our earn or learn or with our incentive to employers to take on people over the age of 50 who've been unemployed for more than six months. There's a record spending uh, PVO in terms of infrastructure, about $125 billion of spin-offs in terms of investment infrastructure. A, a lot so of that infrastructure, really though, is already there. in the pipeline. Like it's, it's bipartisan infrastructure development, in fairness. Well, not re when you look at asset recycling and the $5 billion we put on the table, I'd love to hear the Labor Party come out strongly and support that initiative. I mean, look, the, the Labor Party has a lot to answer for here, Peter. Um, not only did they leave us with a ballooning deficit, unpopular taxes and the re-regulation of the labour market, but now they're refusing to pass savings, about $5 billion worth, that they took to the last election that we've now got before the Senate, and an additional $40 billion worth of savings that we're putting forth. Where is the Labor Party's alternative budget? They, when Bill Shorten got up on budget uh, on the night after the budget night and gave his alternative address, there was no new policy initiatives there. I mean, they are just but in fairness, saying it's no, the first, no, no. In fairness, it's the first year of their time in opposition. You'd expect that closer to the next election. Can, can I ask you, though, Josh Frydenberg, uh, mm. you, you've called out Labor's hypocrisy, and you're absolutely right, mm -hmm. things like higher education cuts that they advocated mm -hmm. that they're no longer going through with. But there mm -hmm. is hypocrisy on both sides. You're now advocating a series of means testing, whereas when Labor first tried to bring means testing in, it was roundly condemned and opposed uh, by the coalition in opposition. Look, I mean, testing is appropriate in, in certain circumstances, but obviously not in all. But we're looking for a balanced approach to the reform agenda here. And one thing I think we can continue to advocate is about the fairness aspect of this package. You see, a lot of people take Medicare co-payments, Peter, would say, oh, that's an extra $7 on lower income families. But in fact, every t uh, the $7 co-payment is actually capped at 10 visits for concession card holders, and there are more than but you 8 need million to reverse that. concession well, card It looks holders. like that's going to get reversed, doesn't it? I mean, it was, it was a policy mm. error in political terms, I think, by Peter Dutton to suggest that the first 10 visits by, by uh, low-income earners will incur, uh, or pensioners, for example, will incur the $7 co-payment, as opposed to uh, the first series of visits after the first 10. I mean, that, that, that's going to get reversed, you would think, in this process, if it's to get through. Look, I don't think it was a policy mistake at all, and Peter has taken the tough decisions here, very conscious of the ballooning cost to the taxpayer of Medicare. I mean, 10 years ago, Medicare cost the taxpayer $8 billion. But you're not doing Today, anything about that. Billion. You're putting it into a fund. It's not going into... I think people could well, understand it more if it went <laughs> into the budget bottom line. Well, there's two things. Firstly, um, hopefully this will have 
a, an impact on behaviour as well and people won't needlessly go to the doctor, but also that that $20 billion for the Medical Future Fund caps out at that and after, after that $20 billion it goes into consolidated revenue. So I, I think this Medicare co-payment is a good policy. Um, the fact that there are these carve-outs, uh, for example, for concession card holders, I think is a good thing. And what Peter Dutton understands better than anyone else is the ballooning cost of the taxpayer of Medicare going forward. And one thing that the Commission of Audit pointed out, Peter, which is really, really important in our, med in our budget sales pitch, is the ageing of the population. You see, we, today we have 13% of the population over the age of 65. By 2050, it doubles to 26%. So everything from the PBS, where we've brought in additional co-payments, to Medicare, to aged care, are going to see higher burdens on the taxpayer. And we have to understand that dynamic, try to allow for it, as well as, for example, around the pension age itself. Mm. All right, some of the other issues uh, attached to the compromises that are going to be necessary to get elements of the budget through, uh, including some of the changes, frankly, around FOFA that have already gone through, sure. uh, they punch a bit of a hole in your effort to reduce red tape, don't they? Not at all. I think FOFA has been one of the standout successes. Uh, you know, nearly but the compromises, $200 million. I, mean, I agree that you're, you really. are cutting red tape with the, with the legislation, but you're not cutting as much because of the forced compromise. Nothing you can do about that. That's the Senate. But you'd have to concede that. Was, that. Well, no, because it's really around the edges. It's a few million. But basically, the bulk of our deregulation agenda when it came to FOFA has got through the Senate, and Matthias deserves a lot of credit for that. I mean, we've done some really good things in this dereg space. I mean, the, the one-stop shops, environmental approvals, the changes around the paid parental leave scheme, so it's no longer having to be administered by small business. Now it can be done by the Family Assistance Office, moving um, to electronic copies for um, jobs service providers and instead of finding job service providers with hundreds of cabinets full of paper documents that they have to lodge. I mean just, just today Peter I've been with the medical device uh, sector and they were talking to me about some of the changes that we are undertaking which is having a streamlining of the processes for them to get approvals. Now that's a good thing. It will have big spin-offs not just our one billion dollar net uh, red tape reduction target that we're on that we're on target to actually reach, but more broadly the economic impact of this deregulation agenda will be exponentially bigger than the $1 billion a year that, of red tape that we are cutting. All right, I've got to ask you about uh, these uh, protesters at your office. We teased it before the ad <laughs> break. Uh, they issued a media release via Facebook, I think. My producer, my very able producer, found it and brought it to my attention. Um, uh, they were going to get arrested, they claimed, if they didn't leave by 5.30, close of business, I suppose. Uh, what <laughs> happened? Were they arrested? Are they still there? Did they leave quietly? Um, I understand that they did leave quietly in the end. The police were there uh, in order to ensure that we could close our office. They've been there all day. Look, people have a legitimate right, of course, to, to protest. Yeah, but they, they went and into your office. They don't have a right to go into your right. office. Well, th this is a good point. And what they uh, If they did this in Tasmania, they'd go to jail <laughs> so, well, <laughs> once that legislation came in. <laughs> Well, Peter, they don't have a right to block constituents who, who want to have their various issues handled, but un unfortunately they, uh, they were, they were um, trying to uh, draw as much attention to, to um, their cause as possible. They have a legitimate rise, a right to protest, but the police were involved and they're no longer there and the office has been closed for the night. All right. Well, Josh Frydenberg, appreciate your time as always. Quick final question, though. Um, how long are you going to have to keep languishing in the parliamentary secretary ranks before you quite rightly get promoted into the ministry? You had uh, the endorsement on the weekend of Chris Kenny. Uh, Peter, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing. We've got our second repeal day on October 29th and we'll work hard as a parliamentary team with the Prime Minister towards that end. Oh, all right, all right. I know you have to say that. Josh Frydenberg, appreciate your time on the <laughs> program. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter.